one of the things that I found very interesting was how you sort of related what you read in the Bible with what it is that you're doing now. What was modeled for us, even when my father served, was purpose. He knew he was in the Church of Uganda specifically to reach out to youth. And Gloria, we watched him do that, whether it was visit schools, and he preached a lot at the school, the secondary school where we went, which mm -hmm. was Gayaza High School, mm -hmm. whether it was starting the Anglican Youth Fellowship, mm -hmm. which was a band that ministered to youth, whether it was wherever he went, youth, and that's what he focused on, and that's what he did, even in his you know his years, all, all the years he spent at St. Francis, youth. Youth was a focus, was a passion, was a thing that drove him, and which keeps him eternally young. And so, again, because that was modeled for me, service and focus, service and focus. What is my purpose? What is my purpose? He was an, a priest. <laughs> and and uh, so faith was also very foundational to many of the things that we did. Mm -hmm. So it, it all connects for me, faith, service, focus. So that is why I went back to my faith to pray, God, what do you want me to do with my life? You're the one who gave it to me. I don't want to be just someone who, you know, was here and passed on. That's not what why God wants us here in this world. We are here for something. But also then to connect, therefore, and, and I think it keeps you centered. Once you have that thing, and, and for me it was a verse. For other people, it is a person speaking into their life. For others, it's a life circumstance. Mm -hmm. For others, it's a story. Mm -hmm. One of my mentors, Miriam Matembe, always says the reason why she's a passionate advocate for women was because she experienced discrimination on so many levels because she was a woman. Mm -hmm. So for her, her story drives her. People will find different anchors for their purpose. Mine was my faith, again, because of what was modeled. Mm -hmm. So, and for you, it could be something else, something in nature, something that was said to you, something that you read. I mean, it's, it's just for us to open our eyes, to grab onto what is it that is my purpose. Even though I don't right now in my current state of life focus exclusively on championing women's rights, the one thing that has remained in what I do is a voice. So if I can be a voice against corruption, if I can be a voice for good governance, if I can be a voice for good electoral practices, if I can be a voice for black-white relationships, if I can be a voice for my continent, whatever I can lend my voice, my advocacy towards, especially if it's a good cause, I am there, count me in, I'll be marching, I'll be picketing, I'll be, you know, I'll, I will be there because I believe that is my purpose. I know that you worked with FIDA. Have you ever considered starting up something yourself? Yes, I have. And I am finally at the point where I have started an organization called Civ Source Africa, whose main mission is three anchors for me. One is to influence, because now in my station of life, I'm in the space of grant making. Mm -hmm. I have been for the last maybe eight or so years of my professional life. So to influence the way grant making is done. Mm -hmm. Because right now, while grant making is good, I think there is still a power imbalance that can come between money and those that receive it. So my, my passion right now is to see how do we create a more egalitarian situation in that? How do we equalize the partnership between those that give money and those that get it? Mm -hmm. So how do we influence grant making? For civil society writ large where I work and especially in the NGO sector, it has its struggles like any other sector in our country. But my passion is how do we build strength? Mm -hmm. And more and more in these two, three months, it's been around, for me specifically, how do we build leadership strength? Because I think an institution, a sector, can only go as far as its leaders mm -hmm. go. So I'm thinking through what can we do to support building the strength of leadership, especially in the NGO sector. Then the third one for me is shaping the narrative of the development story. How is it told? Does it re-victimize the teller mm -hmm. or does it create and encourage a flourishing society? Mm -hmm. You found us doing something, you walked a journey with us, and now we're a bit ahead. Mm -hmm. And so I did finally start something. Of course, I had very many ideas. I mean, violence against women has been something that I feel so deeply about. I thought I'd start a shelter. I haven't. I've thought of a women's museum because I'm a very passionate part of the women's movement in Uganda, the feminist movement in Africa, 
and I thought especially for Uganda, there's no one place that one can go that tells the story, that tells our generation, the generations to come, the generations before us, mm -hmm, where, mm -hmm. what our journey has been, Absolutely. what our struggles have been, where we've come, where we want to go. There's no one, sp and so it's been, I'm thinking I might do it <laughs> in my next decade, of, but it's, it's one of those things that I've, I've wanted to start if I could start something, a museum that tells the story of the women's rights movement in Uganda. I've wanted to start a kids, you know, at a point in time when my children were small and we didn't have enough places to take children to have play and just be kids. I thought, I wish I could start something where you know, children just come and, and have fun and it's not only Diddy's world, right. which I'm sure you left, you know, 20 or so years ago. So I wanted to start <laughs> a children's space. So in different moments of my life, I wanted to start things. But I know that I'm not the only person in the universe. Those things will come. Let me do what I can one step at a time. One of the things I think that I find interesting is when young women want to detach themselves from the idea of feminism, you know, and they don't want to call themselves feminists because they think that there are all these things attached to it when their lives as they are right now could not be what they are without feminism. We don't tell the stories. And this is why we're telling stories. You are very right. Mm -hmm. And there was a time I was on a WhatsApp group and young women were saying, do we need affirmative action after all? We've, we've got it all made, we don't need it anymore. And I felt that moment of sadness of, yes, you may not need it now, but do you know why you're able to say that? And therefore do not denigrate the, the women, the sisters who fought for us to have affirmative action because there was a point in time in our history when parliament was made up of three women and it wasn't that when long our, ago. When there were no women ministers or there was one out of a cabinet of 20, 30. So, and that's why, yes, we need to tell the stories, but that's why we need to memorialize it in a space and time. Yes. So that if I can't find a Goya to tell me the story, there is a space yes. that I can go and have the totality of the story and therefore not take my past for granted, understand my present, and therefore what am I contributing to the continuum to keep making women's lives better. And what about like the privilege of being in a space where you can express yourself and do what you want to do when there are people in Countless. the country Countless. who don't have that same privilege? And I think that's what we forget, that while you may not need affirmative action, we have sisters in Kaberamaido, in Karamoja, in Kavari, in Kisoro, in all parts of where voice and choice yes. is not yet a reality. Yes. yes. So the, the battle is not done as yet. No.